Mr. President. The Senator from New Jersey. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the distinguished chair lady of the Appropriations Committee for the work that she and her staff have put together. It's really remarkable considering the time frame that they were in and, of course, uh, former uh, late Senator Inouye, who, uh, with his staff as well, that the chair lady has inherited. It's just been an exceptional amount of work along with Senator Landry, and so certainly the people of the Northeast, thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to respond. I think Senator Schumer's done a good job overall of uh, talking about our concerns about these amendments, but I want to uh, give a little greater depth and certainly a New Jersey perspective to him. Uh, I do not question uh, the motives of uh, our distinguished colleague from Oklahoma. He's been consistent in that. I don't question his consistency, even though I haven't checked the record, but I'll take his word that even on tax cuts or war spending, he's been consistent. But I do question the consequences of some of his amendments. Consequences to the people of the Northeast, consequences to the people of New Jersey, uh, consequences in the future uh, as it relates to other disasters. And I know at one point he talked about courage in a fiscal sense. Let me tell you, courage is what people in New Jersey are looking at each and every day when they find their businesses closed and are trying to sum up the courage to open up again. Courage is those who have lost their homes and are trying to reopen their homes, which were, could not even do it for the holidays. They were certainly not home for Christmas. Courage is looking at that every day and trying to figure how you move forward. Courage is many of the small municipalities, many who lost their police and fire departments and are working with others to create public safety as they rebuild the very essence of their departments. That's courage, real courage, in the face of incredible challenges. Now, two of the amendments dealing with the Army Corps go straight to that courage. I came to the floor over the last two weeks several times, showed a whole host of visuals to our colleagues for them to understand that we are at the lowest level of protection. It's like an individual whose immune system is virtually gone. And I said then, all we need is a Northeaster to come through, and we will see the consequences of having no defenses. And Unfortunately, yesterday, we suffered a Northeaster. It wasn't the worst of what we could have received, but for several parts of New Jersey, it was certainly bad news. Because those communities that are defenseless as a result of not having Army Corps engineered beaches caught the worst of it again, again in Seabright and Manilokan and several hosts of other communities along the Jersey Shore, they caught the worst of it again. And all the fears and all the nightmares of what they went through under Sandy were relived once again. So when you talk about changing the rules on the Army Corps participation in terms of what he wants as a 90-10 split, number one, that changes the rules. I went over just to make sure I was right about this. I asked Senator Landrieu of Louisiana, wait, wait a minute, in, in Katrina, wasn't there a 90-10 split? And she said yes, and in some cases up to 100. Well, the people of the Northeast, the people of New Jersey and New York deserve no less in their disaster. There are a whole host of communities, even with a 90-10 split, that are going to find it incredibly difficult when 20 or 25 percent of their rateable base is gone to fund the 10 percent that we are asking them. We believe they should have skin in the game, but even at that 10 percent, they're going to have enormous difficulties funding that 10 percent to get the life-saving, property-saving, fiscally responsible solution in having Army Corps engineered beaches. So 9010 is still a challenge to a whole host of communities. Go to the proposition that our colleague from Oklahoma has, and you basically nullify 
their ability to protect their citizens. And I always thought that is the number one priority of any government, federal, state, or local, is to protect their citizens. Certainly the United States Senate should be protecting its citizens, whether it's at broad or at home. And in this respect, we cannot protect our citizens along the New Jersey coastline if, in fact, we cannot have these engineered beaches and if, in fact, you cannot afford to have those engineered beaches. So instead, we will pay billions, talk about being fiscally responsible, in repetitive loss damages. And we will lose lives, as we lost in New Jersey. So I want to save lives, and I want to save property, and I want to save the federal government from paying repetitive losses. And that's why that amendment is certainly not one that we can accept by any stretch of the imagination. It is unfair to the people of the Northeast because it changes the rules of the game, and it is unfair in terms of our obligation to the public safety. I, for one, do not want to be casting a vote that ultimately leaves my fellow New Jerseyans or fellow Americans at risk when I could have saved their lives. I'm certainly not going to do that, and I hope this chamber is not going to do that. Secondly, with reference to the other Army Corps of Engineer Amendment, which would suggest that those projects that are already well underway to being determined and that, in fact, are cost-effective and can save lives and save property and save rateables and save repetitive losses cannot be approved would be, in essence, to guarantee that at the lowest rate of our defenses, uh, we will just suffer an entire winter of incredible misery. So no, Mr. President, we cannot have that amendment pass. Thirdly, with reference to the question of acquisition, look, uh, the governor of New Jersey made that decision, so I can't speak for him, but my understanding is he made that decision from FEMA-approved contracts. Now, if FEMA needs a better process to go ahead and uh, negotiate and or bid in advance of a generic contract, so be it. But a delayed recovery is a failed recovery. And we are already, you know, uh, I, I want my colleagues to remember that 10 days after Hurricane Katrina, this chamber passed two separate bills amounting to $60 billion. It has been nearly two months since we had Superstorm Sandy. And nothing has passed. Two months. Who among us would be content with the counsels of patience and delay if, in fact, we were shivering in the cold? If, in fact, our families had no home? If, in fact, they had been displaced from their schools? If, in fact, their businesses that they worked a lifetime took out debt and now are closed may never open? Who among us would be happy with the counsels of patience and delay? So we cannot have a set of circumstances that creates a series of delays. Now, I'm all for the good government amendments of saying to those who are in debt to the nation that they, in fact, cannot receive any benefits or that those who are deceased, of course, they should not receive any benefits. But the rest of this is about creating delay after delay after delay that is only in the midst of a biting winter. We just had the first Northeaster yesterday. We cannot ultimately accept those types of changes that put us in a process in which, in fact, we will not be able to successfully move the elements of being able to recover. Now, the, this constant reference to that a great part of the money, the overwhelming part of the money, won't be spent, I think I heard, 2015. That is simply not the case whether it be Army Corps of Engineers projects that have already been approved and authorized but not funded that are critical to our defenses, those are ready to go. They just need money. The flexibility that we have sought in this bill, working with 
an incredible insight from what happened in Hurricane Katrina and what worked and did not work. That flexibility will allow money to flow to businesses that are at the crucial point of trying to decide, can I open or not? Because I need to know what the government is going to do for me as part of my equation as to whether I open this business up or not. Because interest, uh, low interest loans from the SBA, even a long-term propositions, is still more debt. And many of these businesses that I have met up and down New Jersey have told me, Senator, I took out money to start this business. I took a debt to start this business. I took out further debt to the Great Recession. More debt doesn't necessarily mean that I will succeed. But a grant, as we authorize here through CDBG block grants, can make very well the difference between me reopening and not, and hiring back people, and being able to have and be part of that rateable base, and paying towards the greater good of the state and the nation. That is what's at stake here as well. And so that money's going to flow if we do this the right way, as this bill envisions. So the suggestion that it's going to take years down the road is just simply not true. Secondly, uh, I think that we lose sight that while, yes, this is about New Jersey and New York and Connecticut, it's about a region, a region that employs 10% of the nation's workforce and accounts for 11% of the entire nation's GDP. 11% of the entire nation's GDP. That's 12.7 million workers and $1.4 trillion in productivity. If you want to see that region continue to contribute to the gross domestic growth, product growth of this country, to continue to contribute to the employment, to continue to contribute to the federal coffers, you need to help it to be able to help themselves, not to turn your back on them. And that's what's at stake here. Finally, I would just say that, you know, there is a whole host of other disasters, and, this, and the committee has been very, very focused on saying nothing goes in this bill that isn't disaster re related, of one disaster or another. And because there have been no other disaster funding, that this has been a vehicle for whether it be wildfires or crop disaster, I, I personally welcome that. Because as I have said many times, this is the United States of America. There's a reason we call it the United States of America. It's so that we are all in this together. And so I welcome the fact that we can help other fellow Americans through this vehicle, whether it be about wildfires or crop disaster or estuaries that, uh, and fisheries that were hurt in other parts of the country at different times, so be it. Because that's what being the United States of America is all about. But we need to pass this bill tomorrow we need to reject these amendments, particularly the ones that I and Senator Schumer have talked about, because it will fail us in our recovery. It will undermine our ability to protect our people. And finally, I would just simply say, you know, we need to pass it so the House can consider this bill as its vehicle when they come back on Sunday. There's no reason this, this bill has been out there for weeks. The President's proposal has been out there for over a month. Everybody knows what's been asked. Everybody knows what's involved. Everybody's seen that the Senate already voted for cloture. Therefore, there's going to be a bill here at the end of the day. There's no reason why the House cannot seek to pass this and respond to our fellow citizens in the Northeast. That's what being the United States of America is all about. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.